This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video will be all about tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's the name for a bacterium. It's actually an acid fast bacillus, which means it can resist decolorization by acids. That's in the context of staining tests for trying to identify certain bacteria. And bacillus means it's rod shaped. So these bacteria are transmitted in airborne particles called droplet nuclei, which are expelled when an infected person coughs, sneezes, speaks, or sings. And nearby people can breathe in these particles and become infected themselves. There's an important interplay between TB and HIV, which I want you to know about. We had a video earlier in the series dedicated to HIV and AIDS, and in that video I talked about immunosuppression as a main facet of that condition. So in that vein, people with HIV are much more likely to get TB. Not only that, but tuberculosis is the leading cause of death among people living with an HIV infection. BCG is the name of the vaccine for tuberculosis, and it stands for Bacillus calmet guerin, named after its inventors. But this vaccine is not widely used in the United States, and it's only recommended for very specific people. And routine immunization against TB is not required for dental professionals. And we'll talk more about testing for TB later in this video. Let's briefly distinguish latent from active infections. So people with a latent TB infection have tuberculosis bacteria in their lungs or in their bodies, but they're not sick because the bacteria are not active. And these people don't have symptoms of TB and they can't spread it to other people. However, they are at risk of developing active TB in the future, so they're often prescribed treatment, this antibiotic called isoniazid, to prevent that from happening. In fact, the CDC encourages treatment for all healthcare workers with untreated latent TB, unless treatment is medically contraindicated for that worker. Now, people with active TB disease are sick from their tuberculosis bacteria, which are actively multiplying and destroying tissue in their lungs. They usually have symptoms including coughing, loss of appetite, night sweats, bloody sputum, chest pain, fever, and fatigue. And these people can spread the TB bacteria to other people through those droplet nuclei. They're prescribed drugs that can treat TB, usually isoniazid plus these additional three drugs. Otherwise, the disease could be very serious and even fatal. So how do we control the spread of this disease in the dental clinic? Well, there are three components to infection control. Administrative is the most important. This would be cutting it off at the source to prevent a transmission from ever happening. So this component of infection control involves reducing the risk of exposure to potentially infectious people. This could include having a written TB infection control plan, giving written instructions to patients, telling them to cover their mouth when they're coughing, educating your staff routinely about signs and symptoms of TB infection, what to look for, and screen for latent TB or TB disease when you're hiring new staff. Environmental control means reducing the spread and concentration of droplets. So perhaps having isolated rooms for suspected or confirmed cases, using high efficiency particulate air filters or HEPA filters, or ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. And finally, the respiratory protective measures are your last resort in case the previous two components fail. So staff in direct contact with patients should wear at least an N95 particulate filtering mask when providing urgent care for patients with a suspected or confirmed case. And TB patients should wear a surgical mask as well. 
Now these tuberculosis specific infection control recommendations are also applicable to preventing transmission of other airborne etiologic agents, like COVID-19 for instance. And although the risk of infection with TB is low in the dental clinical setting, it's still recommended to apply these principles that we just talked about. All right, next let's talk about two kinds of tests that you can conduct in order to screen for tuberculosis in your dental staff. So the first is the TB skin test, also called the Mantaw tuberculin skin test, named after Charles Mantaw, the person who invented it. This test involves two separate days to complete. On the first day, the test is performed by injecting a small amount, that's 0.1 milliliters of fluid, called tuberculin purified protein derivative, or PPD, into the skin on the lower part of the arm. You return on a second day, 48 to 72 hours later, and measure the size of the induration, which is actually a delayed type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. A certain size means a positive result, which means that your body has been infected with TB and additional tests would need to be done to determine if it's either active or latent, and a negative result means that your body has not been infected with TB and has neither the active nor latent infection. The only exception to that is having received the BCG vaccine might lead to a false positive test result, meaning you get that large induration but you've never really been infected with TB, you just got the vaccine prior. This is really important to know for the board exam. All dental personnel who have the potential for exposure to mycobacterium tuberculosis, basically all of them, should be tested for infection either by a skin or blood test, we'll talk about the blood test on the next slide, at the beginning of their employment. Now, Subsequent screening and routine testing are no longer recommended unless there is a known exposure or outbreak in that healthcare facility. So you test everyone before they start working for you, but there's no need to do annual checkups and testing routinely unless you have some sort of exposure or outbreak in your clinic. So the TB blood test is also called an interferon gamma release assay. The quantiferin gold test is another brand name you might have heard of for this blood test. Now some people prefer this one because you only have to show up for one day to get your blood drawn, you don't have to return to get your skin in duration read, and you don't get the false positive results that a skin test might give you if you had the BCG vaccine. Again, either this or the skin test should be done at the beginning of employment, but there's no need for regular tests unless a known exposure or outbreak has occurred. So patient considerations for tuberculosis. So it depends if they have an active or latent TB infection. I'm gonna start down here with the latent ones because it's nice and easy. If it's a latent infection, that means it's non-infectious, so they can be treated in the dental office under standard infection control precautions. If they have an active TB infection, now it depends if they have a non-urgent elective procedure or an urgent need when they arrive at the dental clinic. If it's an elective care procedure, we want to postpone dental treatment and refer them to a medical physician. And once they are deemed non-infectious, then they can be seen for that elective care. If it's an urgent care procedure, patients requiring urgent care should be seen in a facility with an airborne infection isolated room. And standard precautions, again, that's gloves, gowns, surgical masks, are actually not enough to prevent transmission of this active disease. So instead of surgical masks, you would need to wear personal custom fit N95 masks. And then aerosols should be minimized as well. And lastly, some oral manifestations. Now TB manifests infrequently in the oral cavity. If you see anything, it's usually a painful deep ulcer, and it's usually on the tongue. 
It can also appear on the palate, lips, buccal mucosa, or gingiva. Extension of the disease into bones can actually cause osteomyelitis, which is called tuberculous osteomyelitis. It would most often affect the femur, but it can very rarely affect the jaws. And scrofula refers to a TB infection that's outside the lungs, which usually takes the form of inflamed and irritated lymph nodes in the neck. Those would be your cervical lymph nodes, maybe the submandibular lymph node as well. And the nodes become enlarged and painful as a result of that. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.